I'm so excited about the event that we have scheduled today um, with many volunteers who participated, but just a quick shout out to Andrew Post, Ben Holland, Max Loveless, and Melanie DeJulis, who have um, worked diligently on putting something together that we hope will have longevity for, um, for, for HCI. Um, and as, a, as part of a new way to sharing resources that we all can use and um, that our, our faculty are informed about when they come here and then there's a lot on their mind and they don't remember necessarily, but there are also always new developments. So I'm excited to hear about this and let's just dive in here with, I don't know why my, ah, okay, here we go. Well, okay, so here's the welcome formally. Thank you all for being here. And I know many more will probably chime in. Um, we want to inform our cancer research community today about available resources. And 11 resources will be presenting in a very um, timely and intense schedule, um, seven minutes each. But of course, this is just the beginning. Um, since all of these presentations are recorded, you can use the chat function during the presentations and the respective leaders of a shared resource will be available to answer questions in chat. And then um, there will be another opportunity to have a Q&A after all presentations are completed with all leaders. And then this recording and other information will be available for everyone on our website. And I'll send out um, information as part of my, um, I guess it's sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly information from the Cancer Center director. So we'll have those links. And uh, we recognize that there's a lot more than the resources that we have today on the program that we'll have an opportunity to present at a later time. So this is the good looking crowd um, that will be available today. Um, and as you see, we have a, a series of um, esteemed uh, research scientists and, and faculty who are um, presenting from everything from the Utah population database to the Center for Quantitative Cancer Imaging. Um, thank you all for preparing this. You have, um, as part of the invite, the, the, the schedule, so I'm not going to go over that. How are our HCI administered shared resources actually organized? So HCI, Huntsman Cancer Institute itself, manages many different shared resources, but we also partner with the University of Utah Health Sciences System to enable access to 20 additional shared resources. Um, and the HCI senior leaders oversee all of the shared resources and other, not just formal shared resources, but other resources that we will be discussing today. And um, if you have any, any wishes or concerns, you can always bring them right away to the respective director, or you can bring them also to the um, senior director who's overseeing them. We also have faculty advisory committees that are overseeing our resources. And um, if you have a, a dedicated interest in, in one of the shared resources and would like to contribute as a faculty advisory committee member, you can also let our um, senior leadership know and say, hey, I, I think I would like to volunteer for that. It's a good way to know more about the constraints and, and challenges, but also have an impact on new equipment and um, new um, developments. The, the Cancer Center overall supports the shared resources with quite a bit of money. And the, the reason is that we really believe that this is what makes HCI unique as a research community. When people come here um, and they're starting as new faculty, they are always amazed at what is available and what we have built as central infrastructure. And that costs money. Um, a lot of it comes from institutional support and institutional support, I should point out, a lot of it has to do with the clin clinical revenue, the income that comes from the Huntsman Cancer Hospital. And some of it also comes from the Cancer Center Support Grant. It's a smaller fraction, but overall more than $12 million are getting invested annually into providing um, these resources. And the good news is that this, yes, they are getting used, 
um, you see here the hours used are more than 150,000 in fiscal, fiscal year 20, and nearly 500 uh, unique users take advantage of um, this infrastructure. Um, there are, of course, beyond the shared resources, um, many other avenues, and we want to start basically do a, a start of today with, with kickstarting information about um, much of this infrastructure to help you um, be aware. Um, well, we actually did start already with a total cancer care town hall in, uh, that will, uh, was um, recorded in February and is online and we're going to send out the link one more time. Um, we also um, have lab support services that are really critical for all our labs. I mentioned the H HSC and university course and we have also HCI research administration and the clinical trials office. So we're continuing to think how we can do our educational series across um, many of these resources so that you can have them at your fingertip online or you can attend a session just like today. Um, I just wanna give a big shout out to our shared resources and the in incredible uh, positive, generally positive feedback we get. Um, we do annual user surveys and here you can see how our PRR core has been highlighted. David and I have staff are incredibly helpful and attentive. Wendy Coleman and her entire team are incredibly knowledgeable, talented, and excellent collaborators. And there's one here on biostatistics for Ken, Ben, and Jonathan. So um, keep in mind when you do those user surveys, uh, first of all, do them. I think they're very important to give us feedback. They actually get looked at very carefully by central leadership. But um, be both constructive with your criticism or your suggestions, and also be positive about anything that you feel works well, because this is so important um, for our staff to know how valuable they are. And um, last but not least, um, here you, you rarely see them looking that well-dressed, but um, this was part of our CCSG site visit rehearsal. And um, we were so pleased to see after the review of the Cancer Center Support Grant, uh, what exceptional um, feedback we got. So uh, four of our shared resources received an exceptional, which is really, really um, exceptional, which is on the very, very top of the, of the scale. And everybody else did really, really well as well. And I really appreciate how everybody pulled together and this was now recognized uh, by reviewers from all across the United States. So thank you. And with that, I am done with my brief introduction and I'm looking forward to um, the next couple of hours. And I, I guess I'm two minutes behind, but <laughs> yeah, Melanie will um, take on uh, the presentations. And if you have any questions or suggestions for me, feel free to use the chat box as well. So. Thank you again, and onward. Thank you, Neely. Um, my, uh, this is this is going to be a great opportunity for everyone. I just wanted to remind everybody of the mechanics of how this is actually going to go. So my name is Max Loveless. I'm the senior administrative director, and it's been really great to work with um, with so many administrators and Andrew Post and Ben Holland, who have really helped to organize this whole thing. So the the upcoming presentations on the agenda these are recordings. And the reason why we did that is because the, the shared resources have people that, that will be able to field questions in real time. So as you're watching these, they're not actually giving the presentations. They're waiting to hear from you and interact. So feel free to start using the chat function. If they don't get to it in the presentation, like Neely said, at the end, um, we'll be fielding questions in that way. And I'll be storing those questions and, and making sure that all those questions get asked if we can. If they can't, just know that we'll be recording them and, and getting back to you. So we really want this to be an interactive experience. Uh, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and start with the Utah Population Database, uh, Dr. Karen Curtin's presentation that was pre-recorded, and uh, we'll, we'll get going. Thanks everybody for being here. Hello and welcome to the Shared Resource Showcase. My name is Karen Curtin. I'm the Interim Director of the Utah Population Database, or as we call it, the UPDB. 
It's my pleasure to be with you today. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of Epidemiology. Today I'll give you a brief overview of the Utah Population Database shared resource, talk to you about who is represented in the UPDB, what data are contained in the database, how you can access the UPDB, our services and fees, and how to request those services. The UPDB was established by executive order of the governor of Utah formally in 1982 to be a data resource for the collection, storage, study, and dissemination of medical and related information for the purpose of reducing morbidity or mortality and for evaluating and improving the quality of hospital and medical care. The UPDB is located at the Huntsman Cancer Institute Research South building on the first floor by the HCI Shared Resources. The Pedigree and Population Resource is the group that administers and maintains the Utah Population Database. Who is represented in UPDB? It's a broad spectrum of U.S. and Western and Northern European populations. There are pioneer founders of the state and their descendants, and also non-pioneer indigenous and immigrant populations and their descendants to the state, including Hispanic and Pacific Islander communities. Over 185,000 families were originally identified from the Utah Family History Library archives, and we had kinship and demographics on three to 17 generations that were converted to electronic data. Those original families and new families continue to be created today from statewide records. The typical Utah family in the population database is large. Several thousands of descendants are common across thousands of pedigrees, and these families have been used for genetic discovery, such as BRCA1 and 2, breast cancer mutations, and other cancer genes. Records in the UPDB are person-oriented. They're data linked to a person that reflect many events over an individual's life and are a composite record of the most accurate, complete, and up-to-date demographic and medical information that we have access to for an individual. We currently have over 11 million unique persons represented in the pers person-oriented records in the database. This is a snapshot of the records that are available in the UPDB. There are over 35 million records contained in the database, including Utah Vital Records, going back to the early 1900s, uh, medical records from the Utah Department of Health for health facilities data, cancer registry data. We also have Utah voter registrations, driver's licenses, and census data, and those are used to help with address history so that we can geocode people over time, for example, for overlaying environmental exposures. And we also have links to the external records of the clinical data of University of Utah Health and Intermountain Healthcare. And these are very important, uh, our master linkage agreements, where we contain a file that can be used by researchers to link to clinical information at University of Utah Health or Intermountain Healthcare, which gives an opportunity for a deep knowledge of the population by linking many sources of data. These would include pharmacy records, radiology, labs, um, and a, a number of clinical data points across patient populations. Currently, we have 296 active approved research projects. Our portfolio is 45% cancer studies across a variety of, of cancer types and histologies, and also chronic diseases and uh, fetal maternal medicine childhood studies. The UPDB can be accessed one of two ways. The first is through an approved project in which the investigator will take out a University of Utah IRB for their study and select the Utah Population Database. Then that will trigger an ancillary application to RGE, the Resource for Genetic and Epidemiologic Research, the independent body that governs use of our data. Uh, we offer some free consulting to help you through that approval process. If you wish to use Intermountain data, you will need an Intermountain collaborator and an IRB on their side. There's another way to access the data, which does not require IRB RGE approval, and that is to go to our website and under services, select the UPDB limited query tool. This tool can give de-identified information to assess project feasibility and preliminary data for grant applications in terms of counts of various phenotypes, 
which can be grouped a number of ways. There are example videos and step-by-step -step instructions on how to query the database. Anyone can register to, to use the limited query tool. The services we provide, as I mentioned, with no charge, we have a four hour limit where we can help with preliminary data analysis, more complex preliminary queries, provide estimates of our built services, uh, perform initial project planning with you with our PPR staff, and assistance from our UPDB navigator for the approvals. We have a number of billable services that are listed on our website. Uh, probably the major one is creation of a de-identified or limited data set, which is clean and quality control uh, measures taken that is provided for analysis on a virtual machine setting. And we can help test for familial aggregation of disease and familial risks and so on. Our payment model is also listed on our website. Uh, there are annual fees depending on the types of data that are being accessed. Our programmers charge an hourly rate of $70 an hour, and we offer faculty level biostatistical expertise for $125 an hour from the Research Center. This is our uh, PPR staff with Utah Population Database expertise, considerable expertise, our programmers, administration, faculty affiliates. And how to request services, the best way is to reach out to us. Uh, you can look at our website, there's quite a bit of information there, and then email us with your idea and we'll help you get started. Thanks for your time today. Hello, I am Wendy Coleman, Director of the Giant Counseling Shared Resource. I'd like to start off by introducing our team. In addition to myself, our team includes eight other experienced cancer giant counselors, Amanda Gammon, Catherine Koptik, Whitney Espinel, Samantha Greenberg, Jenny Vager, Kinley Garfield, Kristen Pauley, and Ambreen Khan. Our team also includes study coordinators Joe Anson and Sarah Lowe, who have expertise in regulatory issues related to studying patients with hereditary cancer predisposition, including access to patients to, from historic registries, as well as interfacing with the clinic to prospectively recruit patients or implement prevention trials. Ann Nommer is our clinical data manager. The Genic Counseling Team also provides clinical genetic services through the Family Cancer Assessment Clinic. We work closely with Dr. Joanne Jeter, the Medical Director, and Spencer Thomas, the Program Manager, in order to implement studies um, into the clinical setting. The Gen Counseling Shared Resource is able to provide input and support for all aspects of hereditary cancer research. We can provide counts of specific types of mutation carriers that can be used for generating research ideas and determining project feasibility. We can assess in the design of studies and preparation of grants. We have expertise in the regulatory issues related to genetics research, including addressing whether and how to return incidental clinical findings from research, um, inclusion of children, and recruitment of family members. Through our integration with the Family Cancer Assessment Clinic, the Gen Counseling Shared Resource can identify and recruit cohorts of patients and implement prevention trials into the clinic. We can also develop tailored Gen Counseling interventions for implementation science and behavioral science projects. We are also available to assist in data analysis and writing and reviewing papers in order to add perspective on the clinical and translation, translational significance of, of a project. Genetic research often requires collaboration. The Gen Counseling Shared Resource has spearheaded the regulatory process of HCI participating in many of the leading cancer genetics research consortia. This ensures that HCI will be included in these important research efforts, but also gives HCI investigators access to these larger data sets. 
We are founding members of Edison and Perceived Consortia, which are focused on developing early detection strategies for multi-cancer syndromes, such as Lee-Fraumeni syndrome and pancreatic cancer. Other collaborations to highlight are the Orion Inherited Risk Working Group, which is leading efforts to evaluate the germline data being generated on participants in that network. The Jank Housing Shared Resource has also obtained several grants from the Utah Department of Health State Genomics Program to disseminate best practices established here at HCI across the state. We also serve on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guideline Writing Groups, which is another important venue for incorporating HCI research into national policies and guidelines. The Genk Counseling Shared Resource maintains a database of clinical germline genk testing. This includes data to the level of the variant and variant classifications that have been updated over time. Through Grand Challenges grant funding, we have built an infrastructure to incorporate clinical genetic testing data from Intermountain. We currently have over 20,000 clinical genetic test results that have been linked to other information in the Utah population database, such as cancer diagnoses, geographical information, and demographics. And these can be used to study the use of genetic testing across the state. This data set has also been helpful for researchers who are studying familial patterns of cancer in the UPDB in order to determine which families may already have known mutations in cancer predisposition genes. As noted, the Gen Counseling Shared Resource supports a diverse range of studies that involve hereditary cancer. These are examples in which we have developed specific genetic counseling interventions for studies aimed at increasing genetic testing or studying the outcomes of genetic testing. These include implementing family history assessment and genetic counseling in the mobile cancer screening bus, delivery of genetic education to primary care patients through an artificial intelligence chatbot, an assessment of the impact of genetic testing on sun protection behaviors in adults and children from high-risk melanoma families. Examples of studies using clinical data and or patients include evaluation of the effectiveness of whole body MRI or other novel screening approaches for high-risk patients, frequency of germline mutations in patients diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, and communication and chemo prevention trials for women at increased risk for breast cancer. The Gen Counseling Shared Resource is generally able to provide preliminary data for research planning free of charge. We encourage incorporating costs related to other types of services into grants. Because of our integration with the clinic and prospective enrollment of high-risk cohorts, we are able to implement studies efficiently and cost-effectively. The Gen counselors participate in most treatment planning conferences and disease-oriented teams. The goal is to have Gen counselors available at these meetings to discuss projects and ideas with you. Feel free to reach out to myself, any of the Gen counselors you work with, or our study coordinators, Joe and Sarah. I will just end with a reminder of the Gen counselors on our team and some of our areas of specialized expertise. We look forward to working with all of the amazing researchers and clinicians studying hereditary cancer here at Huntsman. Hi, I'm Deb Ma. I oversee the HCI data team that's housed within the Population Sciences Department. We are a central resource available to the HCI research community. We have a goal to facilitate the collection and reporting of accurate data in cancer research here at HCI. We provide disease-centered data support for collection of data on patient populations not related to clinical trials. We also support population sciences investigators and Population Sciences Trials Office approved studies. We support several research tools. The majority of our work is done in the databases internally developed by our Research Informatics Shared Resource. Uh, the nice advantage of using RISER databases for your research is that all data is backed up, 
All changes are audited with both a user and a timestamp, and we can help automate accrual reporting from those systems. So my team facilitates access to those systems. We work closely with, re with research informatics on any enhancements that our customers request. And we can develop reports through SQL Server reporting services. Uh, Research Informatics has a really robust integrated query tool, but if you want reports with custom formatting, visualizations such as like a pie chart, we can do those through SSRS. We also support the HCI instance of REDCap for research survey distribution. We have expertise building questionnaires, including calculations, piping, and branching logic, so we can help you with that. Uh, those data from HCI's instance of REDCap can be integrated with data from RSR. Teleform is another tool that we support. It creates machine readable paper forms. This program can read handwriting and transform it into electronic data. And we found that in some research settings, a paper form is preferable. So um, this program can also write data back to CCR and RSR to integrate with your study, other study information. And the last tool I want to mention is Progeny. It's a tool used to build pedigrees for familial research. Uh, the Genetic Counseling Shared Resource are the main users of Progeny and they maintain the institutional license for that. So we work closely with each disease center leader or an appointed data steward to establish an abstraction protocol based on their priorities. <clears throat> we can also perform targeted abstraction for research or publications. An example of that is the TCC Avatar project. Uh, the entire team performs data management responsibilities, so we can help you with new studies set up in the institutional databases. We can make changes to existing studies or existing uh, cancer center databases, uh, disease center databases. Uh, we can build study specific data structures and questionnaires with the tools I previously mentioned. We can help you with build queries and reports and we can help you with data sets, both quality assurance of those data sets and making sure you have the proper data dictionaries that you need. Uh, we have 20 roughly FTE overall on the team. And I'll just go to this next slide, which shows our wonderful team. This team is truly an example of united effort. I know they have worked with many of you across the Institute. I've listed their names and titles uh, on the left side in the red circle is our staff who support the disease centers of excellence. I have listed the disease center or centers in each person's area of expertise. And if the disease center has multiple databases, I've listed which databases they manage in parentheses. All of the disease center databases are housed in CCR. And then the right side of the chart is our team that supports the PSTO approved studies and population sciences faculty. I've listed the main tools and databases that each person supports there. Those of us in the middle orange area have some responsibilities that, that span both sides of the team. So in terms of our payment model, typically if you're submitting a grant for new human subjects research, it's very helpful if you can budget some FTE for data support. Uh, I can help with those estimates. For more temporary efforts, something that may take a few months, we can work with you on a quote based on the number of hours you think your project would uh, entail, and we can handle that as a PAR adjustment. Some of our efforts, however, are covered through central funding. That includes our disease center data abstraction. Members of the disease centers can work through the disease center's leader or the appointed data steward uh, to help set priorities for our abstraction. So if you have a project requiring either prospective or retrospective abstraction from the electron electronic medical record, uh, you can work through the disease center to, to get our support for that. Projects that require minimal effort, such as a new study database setup, can often be performed under our central funding. Uh, we can typically perform up to five hours of work under our central funding for a given project, and then we'd work with you after that to uh, give you a quote for, for continuing work. Uh, often, through the Population Sciences Trials Office application process. Uh, studies will be deemed institutional priorities. Uh, they'll be approved by the PSTO Faculty Advisory Committee. And often st studies approved through that process will receive full or partial data support centrally funded. 
So how to request our services on the HCI Pulse page, there is a what do you need help with section. If you click on the view all request types link, there is a link for data support. And if you click on that, it will take you to our page. So here you can select what it is exactly that you need help with. Um, this portal is typically used by folks that we're already supporting. So if you're wondering whether we can help with a new study, another great way to request our services is through a PSGO application. Uh, PSGO is under the direction of Lance Lewis. Through PSGO, you can request data support, but also regulatory, study coordination, finance support for your study. Um, so here I've just provided a website that talks more about the services our team provides in the context of PSTO, and there's a link from this page to the PSTO application. So thank you so much for your time. I know this was a really quick overview, so I've also provided my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have additional questions. Hello, my name is Andrew Post, Director of the HCI Research Informatics Shared Resource, or RISER. I also am faculty in biomedical informatics. I would like to tell you about the services that RISER offers to the HCI research community. RISER is a software and database development group that enables HCI to collect and mine data from local, state, and national sources. We serve as the conduit for research and research administration data for HCI investigators the other HCI shared resources, and the HCI disease centers and cancer center research programs. We provide services to anyone at the U for research that is cancer related. Together with the other shared resources, HCI provides a broad array of linked data available for your research. RISER has more than 30 FTEs with expertise in software and database development and support, user interface design, website development, and vendor software support. During COVID, RISER is operating fully remotely and provides all services remotely over video conferencing. After COVID, we will return to the first floor of the HCI Research South Building, where we do in-person consultations in our primary location in University of Utah Research Park. Software that RISER provides include population study and survey data management tools. We typically recommend using HCI's REDCap but we also have other applications that we can offer, including the research subject registry. Contact Population Sciences Data Support, or POPSI, for a consultation on which application best meets the needs of your research, or for access to either of these tools for your research project. RISER and POPSI collaborate on supporting population science-related software. RISER provides database development using a homegrown application called Cancer Clinical Research, or CCR, that allows creating cohorts of patients. It provides forms for chart abstraction and other data capture, extraction of data out of clinical documents via natural language processing, and automated import and linking of data from the enterprise data warehouse and a variety of other sources. The data is queryable in CCR or a reporting tool called IQ, and we can provide custom data extracts for you. Request access to CCR through POPSI and request access to IQ through RISER. We provide specimen tracking data management primarily in concert with the biorepository shared resource using IT Biopath and LabVantage. Contact RISER directly about using these tools. We provide high throughput sequencing data management and sharing using genomics in partnership with the bioinformatics and high throughput sequencing shared resources. Go to Genomics' homepage and select New Account for access or request support from RISER for more information. And we support HCI's clinical trial management system, Encore. Your Encore access will be set up as part of the HCI Clinical Trials Office's process for setting up your clinical trial. We provide a study feasibility assessment tool for the Utah Population Database called UPDB Limited to help you in formulating data requests to the UPDB. You can register directly in the application and request support through the UPDB shared resource. We are happy to provide you with training on any of these software applications and databases. In addition, contact RISER to request custom data extracts from a wide variety of University of Utah databases, including the U of U Health Enterprise Data Warehouse, which contains data from EPIC, our biospecimen tracking databases at HCI, somatic test results from Foundation and Tempus, 
data from the Orion Avatar program, databases developed by RISER for the HCI disease centers and HCI family cancer assessment clinic data. We ask for a minimum of one week to complete data extract requests as staff may be working on multiple requests at the same time. Besides our software and databases, please contact RISER for requests for software product evaluations and surveys of the vendor landscape if you and your colleagues find gaps in what HCI provides that if filled would accelerate your research. Contact RISER for software security reviews, including software developed by your lab. Contact us for help with getting set up on Amazon Web Services for research, including comparisons of alternatives for on-premise servers versus AWS. In partnership with HCI Communications, we can help your lab with data-rich website development. Also, we can facilitate your access to university data resources for your research, like using Canvas in a research project. We generally do not charge for our services. However, RISER may require percent effort for personnel for grants that have a major informatics component that cannot be completed with RISER's existing personnel. We also may require that you budget in your grants for non-personnel costs like custom hardware. Reach out to me several weeks in advance of your grant submission deadline if possible so that RISER can help you determine what to budget. Also at that time, if your grant requires RISER services, I recommend that you request from me a letter of support to include in your grant. Furthermore, we can provide you with boilerplate text describing our software and databases. Note that HCI has a list of approved databases found in policy 6.18 on Pulse. Aside from ensuring data security, using databases from this list ensures that summary accrual statistics can be sent to the NCI as required. While these databases and applications generally meet researchers' needs, contact me if you believe that your specific situation requires the use of something else. To request services, go to our website at risr.hci.utah.edu and click on the I need help or query request buttons. That helps us make sure your request gets to the right people in a timely fashion. Our software applications are available from the application launcher on our website. However, if you need help on where to begin or you want to provide feedback, feel free to reach out to me or RISER's Associate Director, Shirlene Hewitt. If you use any RISER software or services for research reported in a publication, please acknowledge RISER in the manuscript using the text in the link that is on this slide. More information about RISER is available on our website and thank you for listening. The Center for Quantitative Cancer Imaging, referred to as CQCI, is a central resource that provides imaging services to Huntsman Cancer Institute, the University of Utah, and the entire state of Utah. CQCI has four major activities that are performed in dedicated laboratory spaces, including a cyclotron and radiochemistry lab, a PET-CT clinical imaging suite, a preclinical imaging lab, and a Tumor Imaging Response Assessment Lab. CQCI is overseen by Dr. David Gaffney as the HCI Senior Director of Clinical Research. Jeffrey Yap is the Director of CQCI, and the faculty members are in the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences. Dr. John Hoffman is the former Director of CQCI and the Senior Advisor to the Director. Dr. Brandon Buckway is the Director of Cyclotron Operations and a faculty member in the Department of Pharmaceutics and Pharmaceutical Chemistry. There are 17 full-time employees and this multidisciplinary team includes nuclear medicine physicians, radiologists, radiologic technologists, radiochemists, radiopharmacists, cyclotron engineers, and a medical physicist. The Cyclotron and Radiochemistry Lab manufactures and distributes FDA-approved pet radio pharmaceuticals for clinical use throughout the Intermountain West. These pet drugs include FDG for imaging glucose metabolism, sodium fluoride for imaging bone mineralization, 
Visimil for imaging amyloid plaque, and Aximin for imaging prostate cancer. Research PET radiopharmaceuticals are manufactured for clinical trials, including oxygen-15 water for tumor perfusion, fluorothiamidine for cellular proliferation, fluoromyzonidazole for hypoxia, fluoroestradiol for estrogen receptor expression, and other proprietary compounds. All of these PET drugs decay within hours of being made and must be manufactured each day due to the short half-life of the radioisotopes. Pricing for individual patient doses ranges from hundreds to thousands of dollars. CQCI also develops novel radiopharmaceuticals for preclinical use in rodents, as well as previously published research radiopharmaceuticals for use in clinical trials. CQCI owns two dedicated research PET CT scanners that are used in clinical trials of cancer therapeutics and for the evaluation of novel PET drugs. Clinically certified PET CT technologists perform all aspects of the imaging, including quantitative dynamic studies with blood sampling and metabolite analysis. Pricing for PET CT scans in investigator initiated trials are subsidized and typically based on Medicare rates. Industry-sponsored trials are negotiated at competitive rates. CQCI has a preclinical SPECT CT scanner and a one Tesla PET MRI scanner for imaging mice and rats, both of which are located in the HCI Research South Vivarium. Any combination of these four imaging modalities can be used in a single session. Lead shielded animal holding rooms are able to house radioactive animals from imaging and radiotherapeutic studies indefinitely. CQCI staff perform all aspects of image acquisition, processing, and analysis. Most studies can image six to eight animals in a day, and the costs are based on the total imaging time and the materials such as radiopharmaceuticals and anesthesia. The Tumor Imaging Response Assessment Lab supports HCI clinical investigators in trials using imaging endpoints. Image analysts and radiologists perform the standardized tumor and organ measurements. Precision imaging metrics software is used to provide a web-based platform for ordering imaging assessments and the real-time review of patient results. This service is currently supporting more than 175 clinical trials and more than 30 different imaging response criteria, such as RESIST, Lugano, and PCWG3. Imaging assessments for investigator-initiated trials are partially subsidized, while industry-sponsored trials are negotiated based on the number and complexity of imaging response criteria. For questions on imaging response assessments and to schedule research PET CT scans, contact cqci at hci.utah.edu. And for all other inquiries, contact jeffrey.yap at hci. And for more information, please visit the CQCI page on the University of Utah website. The Preclinical Research Resource, or PRR, was first established in 2009 in large part to manage the expansion and distribution of breast cancer patient-derived xenograft models developed by Dr. Alana Welm. Since then, the PRR has continued to evolve and expand the services and resources offered. The PRR's mission is to provide high-quality services that advance basic and translational cancer research drug discovery, and personalized cancer therapy. We have two main aims. One, provide start to finish in vivo study design, execution, and analysis. And aim two, provide the most current and sophisticated cancer models. At the PRR, 
we strive to offer expertise and resources that accelerate cancer research. We start by advising investigators on study design, which can include contributing to grant proposals and budgets, preparing iCook protocols, and training personnel. Next, we can perform in vitro and in vivo studies that, for instance, examine genetic regulation of cancer or therapeutic efficacy and toxicity. We can also develop novel cancer models. Finally, we can analyze the data, prepare reports and figures, and contribute to grant proposals and publications. Our services are broadly outlined here. The PRR maintains a colony of immunocompromised mice for distribution to investigators. We provide colony management services that include regular health surveillance and breeding. For strains with complex genetic alterations, we facilitate genotyping through commercial vendors or in conjunction with the investigator. We have a growing list of cell lines that are pathogen tested and STR authenticated. We maintain this bank to provide low cost access to cell lines and to help investigators comply with increasing requirements for validated reagents. We encourage investigators to contribute low passage cell lines to our bank. The PRR has a dedicated cell culture suite and we perform routine tissue culture, including cell line expansion and sample preparation for xenografting. However, we also perform cell line derivation, tumor cell enrichments, and more recently, organoid development and culturing. The PRR staff has experience with xenografting into many sites in the mouse, and we can perform a variety of survival surgeries. We are always happy to work with investigators to develop new procedures and expand our capabilities. We perform drug formulation and therapeutic dosing, and we also provide many forms of animal treatments such as sublethal irradiation and in vivo viral transduction. We collect study data such as tumor volumes and animal weights, and we can perform blood collection and analysis, necropsies and tumor collections. Our staff can also perform longitudinal in vivo imaging with either a quantum micro CT or bioluminescence imaging with an IVA spectrum. Finally, we streamline study workflows by coordinating with CROs and facilitating interactions with many other shared resources on campus, including Dr. Jeff Yap's Center for Quantitative Cancer Imaging, Genomics with GBA, and Histology through BMP and ARUP. All of these services are included in our broad IACUC protocols and allow us to rapidly initiate studies. Our second aim, to provide the most current and sophisticated cancer models, continues to involve patient-derived xenografts, or PDX. PDX are derived directly from patient tissue and propagated in mice. These models retain many of the attributes of the original patient tumors and are often considered the best preclinical in vivo model for predicting clinical outcomes. After a decade of generating PDX, we have developed a robust pipeline to rapidly go from an investigator's interest to a PDX model. In coordination with clinicians, BMP, and research informatics, we can retrieve patient samples for immediate implantation or cryopreservation in implantation at a later time. PDX are expanded through repeated passaging and preliminary characterization includes tumor growth rates, histopathology, SDR authentication, and genomics. We have established over 100 PDX models and maintain many of these for distribution to investigators. Alternatively, we can assist investigators in importing PDX from external institutes and PDX consortiums to ensure compliance with IACUC regulations. With the increasing demand for in vitro models that better reflect human cancer, we are expanding our services to include the development of culturing of 3D organoid models and 2D cell lines derived from either patient samples or established PDX. In addition to the services described, the PRR oversees several pieces of equipment, including those for tissue processing and histology, blood analysis, 
a small animal X-ray irradiator, and IVA spectrum for in vivo bioluminescence imaging. And we can also provide various reagents, such as major gel, specialized media, mice, cell lines, and PDX. Our services go beyond what has been described here. And so please contact us with any questions regarding how the PRR can contribute to your research, our pricing, or scheduling and equipment. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Chris Fillmore. I'm the director of the Biorepository Molecular Pathology, BMP, Shared Resource. And I'm going to give a quick overview as to the services that we provide to support research at Huntsman Cancer Institute and also UUMC. BMP is collecting, processing, and banking samples from cancer patients who are coming in for treatment at Huntsman Hospital and also UMC. And these samples consist of tissue, blood, body fluids, et cetera. Uh, these biospecimens are supplied to research to support oncology-focused research projects. And these annotated samples can be provided as de-identified materials or with full patient information, depending on your need. BMP is also offering services for molecular diagnostics needs, such as DDPCR, nanostring analysis, LCM, DNA and RNA extraction, and John O'Shea, who is the Section Director for Molecular Diagnostics, is going to go into this in more detail. We also supply research histology services. We collect FFPE blocks for all patient samples. And we can have slides cut from these blocks, stained, and then funnel them into pathology analysis if needed. Uh, BMP cons currently consists of 26 FTEs. Here are some of the key people listed. Uh, I'm the director. John O'Shea is a molecular di diagnostics director. Lindsay Fairborn is the research histology team lead. Andy Lee heads the tissue collection group. Jeannie Pierce heads the blood collection team. Glenda Peck is our program manager. And John Knowles is responsible for disbursement and distribution of samples that are already banked. Our payment model is as a recharge center. So we're charging each project for the specific services provided. But these charges are subsidized by HCI at two thirds. So you're only paying one third of the actual costs uh, for all of the services associated with your project. Um, how do you request services? Well, all samples must be obtained from patients who have agreed to an informed consent. And so an IRB consent form must be signed. The Total Cancer Care Protocol, or TCC, is the institutional umbrella IRB collection protocol here at Huntsman. And everyone here is welcome to use this to collect patient samples. You can also apply for your own IRB protocol, depending on your needs. Uh, the consents that the patients sign are then linked to their samples within an inventory management database. We have been using IT Biopath uh, for this, which is an in-house software that's been in, in use for several years. We're currently moving over to LabVantage, which is a commercial software uh, for inventory management. Uh, all of the patient samples also have clinical data associated and also, also uh, the pathology reports. So there's a wealth of information uh, available for every sample that we have in the biobank. All procedures within BMP are CAP certified. So we're compliant with College of American Pathologists protocols, which is an additional level of quality. To collect samples, please contact BMP to set up a project. And we can then help you work with the TCC consenters and coordinators to track and approach appropriate patients uh, for your needs. We can also help you set up a collaboration with pathology so that you can have a pathologist help with review of your slides and QC and stuff like that. If you want to request samples that are already banked, please contact BMP and we can help you check availability to see what's in the biobank. And we can also help request permissions from the people or projects or disease centers who have collected specific samples. 
This is a data set showing the current holdings within the biobank by tissue type. Um, the numbers represent the number of different aliquots that we have. Uh, this just shows the range of different types of tissues that we have within our collection, different types of cancer, etc. So it's a very broad range of uh, uh, different uh, samples that are available. We also have bloods uh, that are collected uh, for most of these tissue types from the same patients. Uh, and in many cases, if uh, the bloods have been used to generate DNA, if DNA has been extracted, uh, we also bank some of that material. So there may be DNA available for all these materials as well, already prepared. Uh, so please reach out to us uh, and uh, we can help you uh, to, to assess what's available. For more information, uh, you can go to our website um, and see specifically what services are available, what the pricing is, uh, all of the contact information. Um, I believe you're also getting a handout for each shared resource that shows contact information and the website address. So please reach out to us or to me specifically if you have additional questions. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is John O'Shea and I direct the Molecular Diagnostics section of the Biorepository and Molecular Pathology Shared Resource. The BMP is made up of three sections, the Biorepository, Research Histology, and Molecular Diagnostics. We all work seamlessly to support clinical, translational, and basic research at the Huntsman Cancer Institute and the University of Utah. You will hear more about the services offered by the Biorepository in another talk today by Chris Fillmore. Research Histology is an Arab run resource and they provide a wide variety of routine and specialized histology services. In this talk, I will give a brief overview of the services offered in the Molecular Diagnostics Core. One of the key services that we provide are nucleic acid extractions, which are all performed while adhering to the strict requirements and guidelines of the Biorepositories College of American Pathology accreditation. We utilize standard operating procedures specifically written for each extraction type. We also include an extraction control in each batch of extractions allowing us to track performance across batches and time. Each extracted sample is quantified by nanodrop and qubit, and we assess nucleic acid quality via tape station analysis, analysis, providing a DNA or RNA integrity score. All of our extractions are automated on Kyogen's Kyocube instrument, and we exclusively use Kyogen kits in the lab. Extractions can be performed on a wide variety of sample types, providing DNA or RNA, or for certain sample types, both DNA and RNA can be obtained from the same sample. From formalin fixed paraffin embedded blocks, we can use scrolls or punches as direct inputs into our extraction process. From slides, we can dissect and enrich for specific areas of interest, such as tumor or uninvolved regions. Uh, we are also planning to add an automated tissue dissection system in the near future, which will facilitate precise and consistent recovery of areas of interest and provide enhanced levels of documentation of the dissection process. Pax gene fixation is an alternative to formalin fixation, and it retains almost all the advantages of formalin fixed material, including preserving tissue morphology, without the destructive cross-linking and degradation found in formalin fixed samples. This can improve the quality of the nucleic acid obtained and enhance any downstream molecular analysis. Fresher frozen tissue generally provides the highest quality DNA and RNA, which is the optimal input for molecular analysis, especially sequencing. This is the ideal method to collect material intended for use in future molecular assays and will be the preferred collection method if your project allows. Finally, we isolate primarily DNA from blood and blood products such as buffy coat or plasma. We also have protocols in place for cell-free DNA isolation, which can be a key component for studies tracking treatment efficacy and early detection of residual disease. 
Recently, we installed a Zeiss Palm Microbeam laser capture microscope, and we have used it to isolate material down to single cells for molecular and protein downstream analysis. Regions of interest are catapulted with a brief laser pulse into an inverted collection tube, allowing for contact-free isolation. We have protocols to isolate DNA and RNA from both fresh frozen and fixed tissue. And for new product or for new projects, we recommend using uh, the pen slides, um, but the instrument also has a function to work with previously cut glass slides and archived material. We also offer a number of targeted uh, genomic analysis platforms. The Agena Mass Array is a PCR-driven mass spectrometry-based system for high-throughput SNP genotyping, somatic mutation profiling, sample identification, and methylation analysis of DNA. This platform is cost-effective and well-suited to interrogating a small number of variants across a large number of samples. We also have a Biorad QX200 AutoDG droplet digital PCR system, which provides absolute quantification of target DNA or RNA molecules using EBA Green or TACMAN based uh, probe chemistry. Uh, this has applications in cancer biomarker, copy number variation, and gene expression studies. It is particularly well suited to detecting low abundance molecules such as mutation detection in circulating tumor DNA. Digital PCR takes a standard bulk PCR reaction and separates it into a number of smaller reaction volumes. The Biorad system separates each 20 microliter reaction into 20,000 droplets. Each droplet that contains a copy of your target will undergo PCR amplification, cleaving your TACMAN probe, producing a positive fluorescent signal, this allows absolute quantification of copies of your target without the need for a standard curve as is required in qPCR. The last platform that I will discuss here is Nanostring Technologies Encounter platform. So this utilizes an amplification free color coded barcode technology to directly measure levels of individual target molecules, either RNA, DNA or protein. Uh, so this is applications in as or applications in assaying RNA expression, and you can measure up to 800 genes in a single sample. Sample DNA aberrations can be interrogated using copy number variation or gene fusion panels targeting specific cancer types. Um, custom panels can also be generated to interrogate specific genes of interest for your project or your lab, looking at anywhere between 12 and 192 gene targets. Finally, Nanostring recently launched a digital spatial profiling platform called Geomics. This will allow interrogation of gene and protein levels in user-defined regions of FFPE slides down to single cell resolution. Using UV photocleavable oligos attached to either RNA targeting oligos or protein targeting antibodies, it is possible to assess hundreds of protein targets and whole transcriptome RNA analysis from user-defined regions. We hope to be offering services on this instrument early this summer. Our payment model seeks to cover all of our reagent costs and include a small charge for the labor. This means that our services are very competitively priced and pretty close to what it would cost to perform the service in your own lab. Experiment, experiment requests can be placed and data is returned through the Research Informatics Shared Resource developed web app Genomics. And this is the same app that is used by the High Throughput Genomics uh, Shared Resource. You can find information on all of our services at our website. If you have any questions or are interested in finding out how our core can help you in your research, uh, please contact me at john.oshea at hci.utah.edu. Thank you for your time. Hello folks, my name is David Nix. I am Director of the Bioinformatics Shared Resource located in the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. In this talk, I will describe our key services, our service model, and introduce you to the members of our core and some of their areas of expertise. 
In the BSR, we are dedicated to providing state-of-the-art services and infrastructure to meet the bioinformatic needs of investigators at HCI and the University of Utah. Our services can be broken into four key areas. The first is bioinformatic consultation on project design, analysis strategy, grant and manuscript preparation, and one-on-one -on -one training. The second is bioinformatic analysis. We vet existing applications and where needed, build tools into workflows to analyze all of the primary next generation sequencing experiment data types, including RNA-seq, DNA-seq, ChIP-seq, microbiome, and metagenomics. The third key service we provide is infrastructure to enable state-of-the-art analysis and genomic data management. This includes computation. We utilize two large BSR dedicated compute clusters at CHPC, multiple Linux and Mac workstations at HCI, and several large file servers with hundreds of terabytes of data storage. Genomic data management is a surprisingly complex and continuously evolving challenge that utilizes local HCI resources, including the genomics LIM system developed by the Research Informatics Shared Resource, and several cloud-based solutions, including Seven Bridges, Amazon, and Google. Our core processes all of the raw sequencing data from the high-throughput genomic shared resource, including uploads of the final FASTQ data sets into the LIMs and Seven Bridges. We also develop and maintain several large custom software analysis packages written in Java, Perl, and R, and license commercial software from Kyogen for pathway analysis, from Seven Bridges for cloud-based analysis, and Hive instance of CBile portal for integrating clinical and molecular data sets. This is part of our translational genomic service that I will discuss in a few slides. Our service model is straightforward. Since we are jointly funded by HCI and the Health Science Center, all services are provided equally with no preference in cost or priority. For projects requiring less than 40 hours of hands-on analysis time, we recommend using our hourly chargeback mechanism. I should mention this is a greatly subsidized service. Hourly projects are handled using an automated request tracker on a first-come, first-served basis. Simple e simply email the tracker with a brief description of your request and the next available analyst will contact you. We do require a work authorization form with the university chart field account. For projects needing more than 40 hours of work, we request that you add the appropriate bioinformatician to your grant as a percent FTE. This is more expensive than the hourly rates, but isn't capped at 40 hours per project. It provides you with a dedicated analyst and your requests take priority. Our areas of expertise are many. Our team is comprised of nine people. Most, but not all, work 100% for the BSR. About half of the FTEs are directly client-facing, with the other half focused on infrastructure and translational genomics. Instead of running through this list of expertise, I've asked each of our team to prepare a slide to highlight a few areas of special interest to them. Tim Parnell is the Associate Director of the BSR. A primary focus of his work is on all forms of ChIP-seq analysis for interrogating epigenetic marks, chromatin state, and methylation status. He's also the core Seven Bridges data wrangler. Chris Steuben is a senior genomic analyst in the core who is focused on developing RNA sequencing analytics for standard bulk RNA-seq and single cell sequencing. His R scripts and markdown summary reports are not only beautiful, but used by the entire BSR. He is also the Corps' lead IPA expert. Brian Lohman is one of the more recent recruits to the BSR. His expertise is in single-cell sequencing. This dovetails nicely with his strong background in biostatistics and transcriptomics. Ching Li is the Corps' lead analyst for microbiome and metagenomic experiments. These are some of the most challenging data types to work with. She's developed several NextFlow workflows to support the KIND2 and HUMAN2 analysis packages. Although Bing Feng has his own lab in the Health Science Center, he graciously works in the BSR part-time as our lead germline data DNA variant analyst. His software packages for disease gene analysis are widely used and in some cases commercially licensed. Julie Boyle is another recent recruit to the BSR and has focused on DNA variant classification. Her work with the genetic counselors and their RSR database helped close the loop in our translational genomics program by bringing all of the HCI patient germline testing results into the BSR. 
And although I wear many hats in the BSR, one of my favorites is working on the translational genomics program. It has three components. First, we collect all the raw HCI patient molecular data from research and clinical testing programs in collaboration with uh, research informatics. Um, we create, optimize, and run harmonized analysis workflows on these data sets. And lastly, load these, load these process data sets into command line and web-based query tools. To date, we have collected and processed near 14,000 patient data sets from the Orion Avatar Research Consortium, from Foundation Tempest, and shortly Keras clinical somatic test providers, and germline testing, as I mentioned, through the genetic counseling uh, shared resource. It's wonderful to have these harmonized molecular data sets, but the utility is best realized when combined with clinical information. Toward this end, Aaron Atkinson has taken up the challenge of extracting clinical attributes from a multitude of HCI databases, matching these with patient molecular data, and uploading them into an optimized instance of CBioPortal. CBioPortal is a platform for interactive exploration of multidimensional genomic data sets and is a critical tool in our translational genomics program. So that is a quick overview of the services we provide, our service model, and a high-level view of the bioinformatic analysis expertise we provide. Our CORE's website is up to date. Visit our GitHub repo if you'd like to access some of our software packages. And for analysis help, send our request tracker an email. And lastly, don't hesitate to reach out to Tim or I regarding your bioinformatic needs. Hi, I'm Brian Daly, Director of the High Throughput Genomics Core Facility, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide a quick overview of the services available at the resource. Launched in 1997 as the Microarray Core Facility, by the year 2009, the resource began to transition towards applications supported by the Illumina sequencing platform. The resource completed this transition approximately five years later. In this presentation, I will review the services available through the core facility to support next generation sequencing at the Cancer Center. A good NGS experiment begins with validating sample quality. Assays performed on two instruments, the Invitrogen Qubit and the Agilent Tape Station, are used for sample validation. The Invitrogen Qubit uses highly sensitive fluorescent dyes to measure the concentration of specific classes of nucleic acids. Targeting either RNA or DNA molecules, it effectively removes the bias presented by a nanodrop in which one cannot distinguish DNA from RNA when performing an A260 measurement. The Cuba assay is available as a standalone offering for sample QC. It is also included as part of the services associated with library preparation package offered through the core facility. Agilent tape station assays are used to qualify RNA samples prior to library preparation. The tape station assay assigns an RNA integrity number, also known as a RIN value, which scores the quality of each sample using a numeric value from 1 to 10. The tape station assay is performed on all RNA samples as part of the services included in library preparation. It is used as a means to establish confidence that library preparation can be successfully performed prior to initiating the more expensive steps of a sequencing experiment. Diverse library preparation applications are available through the High Throughput Genomics Core Facility to support whole genome sequencing, exome and custom enrichment, DNA methylation profiling, ChIP-seq, CRISPR profiling, 16S RDNA, RNA sequencing, RNA exome, and small RNA profiling. We offer strategies for ultra low input samples in addition to standard protocols when a larger quantity of sample is available. Included in the library preparation kits that we support are several single cell sequencing applications made available through 10X Genomics. This includes 3' and 5' gene expression libraries, BDJ profiling of immune cells, and single cell attack seq. Pricing for library preparation at the core facility includes the following three services. 
sample quality assays, library construction with either kitted or customized protocols, and library quality control assays. In addition to being included as part of the library preparation package, Library QC is also available as a standalone offering for customers that construct libraries in their own labs. This service includes a Cuba assay to measure the concentration of the library, a tape station assay to evaluate the size distribution and to verify whether the library is free of anomalies, and a qPCR assay to quantitate the molarity of adapter modified library molecules. Following the completion of qPCR, libraries are normalized and pooled in preparation for sequencing. The core facility currently supports two sequencing platforms, the Illumina MySeq and the Illumina NovaSeq. The HiSeq 2500 instruments were recently retired. But before I provide additional information about the NovaSeq and MySeq, I will provide a brief background story about the machine that goes ping. When we purchased our first HiSeq 2500, which cost three quarters of a million dollars, Brad stopped by the lab and asked if the machine goes ping. He repeated his question and I had no idea what he was talking about. But as soon as he left the lab, a Monty Python YouTube video quickly educated me about the machine that goes ping. It was the most expensive machine in the hospital that costs three quarters of a million pounds and makes a ping sound when it starts to indicate that everything was working just fine. The HiSeq 2500 never made the ping sound, and it was three quarters of a million dollars, but not pounds. So I emailed a senior level Illumina employee about Brad's machine that goes ping inquiry and included the YouTube clip. And a half dozen years later, when we purchased the NovaSeq, we discovered that after successfully completing diagnostics at the start of the very first run, the machine does go ping. Illumina also upgraded the price of this machine to $1 million or three quarters of a million pounds. And so if you're at a meeting talking with colleagues or visiting with friends or sharing a holiday with your family and they ask if the Huntsman Cancer Institute has the machine that goes ping, you can now tell them that indeed it does. But before further discussing this amazing machine, I will show a brief slide about the MySeq. The MySeq supports small sequencing projects such as 16S RDNA or Amplicon libraries enriched for targeted gene regions. Flow cells available for the MySeq yield 1 million to 25 million sequence reads per run and support diverse run lengths, which are as short as 50 base pairs or as long as 600 base pairs when a sequence run is set up as a 300 base paired end run. The NovaSeq, also known as the machine that goes ping, represents Illumina's latest high production instrument. Similar to the MySeq, it offers diverse run lengths. However, it performs these runs at a much lower cost per quantity of sequence reads and is currently Illumina's lowest cost sequencing machine for data. The NovaSeq tends to be the instrument of choice for approximately 95% of the projects that come into the core facility, including whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, single cell sequencing, and most other applications. Examples of a few of the price options are available on the slide. Arriving at the end of this presentation, I would like to acknowledge my lab. Jeanette, Opal, and Katie are talented, enthusiastic, and are likewise a great resource for answering your NGS questions or for consulting with prior to starting an NGS project. Hi, my name is Ben Holland. I'm the co-director of the Cancer Biostatistics Shared Resource at Huntsman Cancer Institute. I'm also faculty in the Division of Biostatistics in the Department of Population Health Sciences at the University of Utah. I'd like to introduce the Cancer Biostatistics Shared Resource to you today. 
and share with you some of the services that it offers to HCI investigators. Cancer Biostatistics provides biostatistical consulting services to cancer investigators at Huntsman Cancer Institute and the entire University of Utah. The biostatistical services that we provide include analysis and expertise in research study design for grant development, clinical trial development, and research projects. Specifically, these include review and reporting, mentoring and education, statistical analysis, research study design, and development of monitoring and statistical analysis plans. Cancer Biostatistics aims to enhance scientific rigor, transparency, and replicability, to tailor statistical approaches to the needs of projects, and to develop statistical material for clinical trials and proposals for external funding. Cancer Biostatistics faculty and staff. Cancer Biostatistics has 13 faculty and staff totaling 8.8 .8 full-time equivalents. Cancer Biostatistics is co-directed by Ken Boucher in the upper left-hand corner and myself, Ben Holland, the middle picture. Ken Boucher is one of our faculty biostatisticians. He has expertise in clinical trials, particularly design and analysis of phase one and phase two clinical trials, analysis of high throughput genomics, carcinogenesis modeling, and cancer epidemiology. Ben Holland is another of our faculty biostatisticians. He has expertise in analysis of electronic health record data, design and analysis of clinical trials, machine learning, and longitudinal and multi-level data analysis. Jonathan Chipman is another of our faculty biostatisticians with expertise in clinical trials, particularly adaptive randomization and monitoring schemes, comparative effectiveness studies based on observational data and electronic health record data. Continuing to introduce faculty and staff, Tom Green is a biostatistician with expertise in modern causal inference, clinical trial design, and surrogate endpoints for clinical trials. Jincheng Shen has expertise in behavioral methods, statistical genetics and genomics, and causal inference. Alan Thomas has expertise in statistical genetics and computing and Bayesian statistics. Lisa Pappas has expertise in analysis of surveys, registry data, and large observational cohorts. Judy O oh is an expert in cancer and environmental epidemiology and cancer survivorship. And Jian Ying is an expert in big data, machine learning, and statistical genetics. Mm. Last but not least, we have Yusuke Shono, who's an expert in psychometric methods, health disparities, and implementation research. Tenga Lin, an expert in cancer epidemiology, omics, and machine learning. Cancer Biostatistics also has two PhD students who work on projects with HCI investigators and other cancer researchers at the University of Utah. We have Catherine Wong, who is an expert in analysis of time-varying exposures and interventions and comparative effectiveness, and Yunjung Zhou, who is an expert in analysis of electronic health record data, biomarkers, and trial design and monitoring. Cancer Biostatistics Payment Model. Cancer Biostatistics faculty and staff are most typically supported via FTE funding on external grants. However, hourly payment for general consulting, study design, and analysis is also available at a rate of $85 to $150 per hour, depending on the level of support, whether it's faculty, master statistician, and so on. Importantly, Biostatistical work in support of applications for external funding and in support of investigator-initiated trials is high priority, and this work is supported by the Cancer Center. This includes study design, 
monitoring plans and statistical analysis plans and power and sample size, as well as preliminary results generation for IITs and proposals for external funding. First come, first serve support is available for other cancer focused research, such as retrospective studies with no grant support or industry sponsored non IIT clinical trials. To request services from Cancer Biostatistics, please visit our website. The URL is given here. On our website, you can request services by clicking this button, Request Collaboration, which will take you to a form which requests more information about your project. You can also Google HCI Cancer Biostat then click the first link and it will take you to our web page. Also, you can request services by directly emailing Ken Boucher or myself. Ken's email is kenneth.boucher at hci.utah.edu and my email is benjamin.holland at hci.utah.edu. For more information about cancer biostatistics, including faculty and staff profiles, frequently asked questions, and HCI oversight, please visit our website. Thank you. Okay. Um, that is the end of our showcase. And uh, just want to give a big thank you to everybody who is involved in, in putting those presentations together. Um, I know that it was a little bit of work involved, so <laughs> uh, I think that it came out great. And thanks for everybody that has already participated in asking questions via chat. So the next portion of our meeting will be answering questions. Um, we have received some questions ahead of time. Um, so. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be monitoring the questions as they come in through the chat and I would just ask that that, that would be the method that we um, that we use and then I can I can triage the questions as they come in. Um, and then before, as people are kind of formulating that I also just want to make an announcement about um, a summary page of our shared resources. So as a part of this uh, showcase this event. Um, the shared resource leaders have prepared brief summaries of their services that you can look at yourself, of course, pass along to new faculty, new postdocs. Really, they're there for anybody uh, to look at, and that was posted in the chat. So you might need to uh, go back a little bit to find it. Uh, so the first question we've received um, is, are the slides available somewhere? Um, oh, thank you, Melanie. She just posted the, the written summary. Yes, the, the slides will be available. The presentations will be available. Um, uh, after the fact, we'll be posting them on online. Um, and, and so we'll make sure that, every, that, that that's going to be publicly available. Um, where we sent um, the announcement of this event, um, we will send out links to the presentations themselves. Um, we really want to get the, this um, out uh, to the community. That's one of the reasons why it was recorded is so that we could continue to use it. So we want to make sure that it's available. So please look for that. Um, okay, it looks like there's an up, updated link for the summary. Okay, um, I do. So here, here's a question that came in ahead of time, and it's for genetic counseling. Um, it asks, what kinds of IRB, um, Institutional Review Board, uh, approval is needed to access genetic testing or clinical data on high-risk patients? Um, yeah, thanks, Max. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, it, it sort of depends on what people want, um, but generally we are able to give things like general counts of like, for example, types of mutation carriers and things. Um, for anyone who's interested in that information for study planning purposes without any specific IRB. Um, we do have um, IRBs that cover a lot of the use of um, genetic data. Um, 
We have a usage protocol for TCC, as well as some other specific um, protocols looking at screening outcomes. So once again, depending on what an investigator is looking for, we may have an IRB that meets their needs that we could add them to. Um, but then, um, you know, if someone is wanting to perhaps recontact patients um, or do a specific um, intervention trial type thing, then we generally that would require an IRB. Um, but we're, you know, we're available to help with that and to help, you know, create the language um, to handshake between, you know, the existing data sets and things that they may be pulling from. So, um, yeah, kind of a combination of maybe you need to write one, but there's a lot that we can often help with without creating brand new IRBs. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so one question from Chelsea Smith is, how is this format perceived by the group? Any recommendations for future shared resource showcase? So I just want to address this a, a little bit too, is that the plan is, is that we would have these showcases uh, potentially uh, annually, maybe less frequently or more frequently as, as we feel like we need. But this is just kind of a, uh, this is a, a group of our sort resources, but obviously there are more resources that people use um, and so as you think of anybody on this call, as you think of resources that are housed in HCI or that HCI faculty, postdocs, anybody in, in the group use a lot that, that you would like to see a showcase, go ahead and send me an email and we'll add it to our already existing list and, and, we'll, and we'll include it in a showcase in the future. Um, okay, another question for uh, bioinformatic um, analysis. Um, I'd like to learn to process my own data. What resources are available to me and can the BSR help? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. That's exactly the kind of thing that we like to hear. Um, the best analysis approach with us um, is to actually have a liaison in the lab that we work with directly. And aside from some basic computer skills, we can get you started in one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutorials. Um, Pretty much you uh, have access to a variety of uh, Linux workstations at Huntsman Cancer, and we can connect you up and get you accounts to work over at CHPC on their clusters. Um, I would suggest contacting me and we'll set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment and get you going. Um, there are some formal classes you can take. Definitely look into the Center for High Performance Computing. Year round, they're running workshops that typically take you know, one to two weeks meeting once or twice a week on how to start using the Linux platform, how to start using cluster and cluster management. But also don't miss Aaron Quinlan's um, Applied Computational Genomics class. And I just checked, he's holding it this, uh, this spring. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, introduction to the world of uh, genomic analysis. Great, thanks a lot, David. Um, looks like we have another question in the chat. It um, says, I have a question for uh, Karen Curtin at UPDB. How difficult is it to share UPDB pedigrees with external institutions? Note that pedigree structure is deemed um, uh, identifi uh, identifiable data. Is, uh... Is Karen on the on the call or somebody from UPDB that could field this? We, if not, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Karen wasn't able to be here um, for the first or for portions of this. Um, we were hoping she would be able to return, but um, yeah, maybe we can get back to that. Yeah, that, that's definitely okay. Yeah, and, and if we can't get to all of the questions that we've received, again, that'll be a place that uh, we'll have the uh, shared resource directors respond to and it will be available on a, uh, on a website and we'll let people know where that is. Okay, um, next question. Let's see, this is for uh, Chris Fillmore um, at the BNP. So are samples available with annotated clinical patient data or as de-identified samples? Yeah, thanks, Max. Uh, samples are available at, as either, depending on what your needs are. We have full clinical data tracked in the uh, IT Biopath database, et cetera, associated with each sample. But some people don't want that. Some people just want de-identified data. And it really depends on what your needs are. We can, we can do whatever you want. Excellent. OK. This is it's very helpful. OK. Um, another question. Uh, this is 
probably for John Roche. Uh, why would I use digital PCR in place of quantitative PCR? Thanks, Max. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so the nice thing about digital PCR is um, it allows you to absolutely quantify what you have in your, in your sample. Um, so as I mentioned, the bulk PCR reaction is divided into a number of smaller reactions. And each one of those reactions is either going to have a copy of your target or not. Um, so this works really well in, you know, for example, samples where you have a limited amount. So from cell-free DNA, where you just don't get a lot of material or from, uh, you know, clinical samples where there isn't a lot of material available. Um, it's a lot more sensitive than qPCR. Um, yeah, they're, they're the two big, big advantages, I think, to, to digital PCR over qPCR. All right, great. Okay, thanks, John. Um, and it looks like uh, Dr. Curtin's come back from a previous uh, commitment. Um, and uh, Karen, so we received a, a question asking about how difficult it would be for UPDB pedigrees with external institutions and notes that pedigree structure is deemed ident identifiable data. Um, well, we certainly have projects that there are external investigators that have partnered up with the University of Utah investigator that are looking at projects that use pedigrees. And what we have in place for that is the external investigator has to sign the appropriate uh, RGE committee confidentiality forms for uh, being able to view any information from the Utah population database. Uh, so they could certainly look at a pedigree. It's possible to de-identify uh, pedigrees to some extent by masking gender, masking birth year, and simply showing where in the pedigree the phenotype is. Uh, we often, you know, do those types of things. And but if a if an actual file went to an external investigator, there would need to be a material transfer agreement in place, uh, which is you know, certainly doable. So the answer is a qualified yes, an external uh, investigator could have access to some pedigree information. It's going to depend on the approved project and uh, having an investigator here at, at the University of Utah. All right, thank you, Karen. That's great, the detail. Um, all right, so then another question, this is either for Ken or for Ben. Um, what is the cost of statistical support for preparing proposals for external funding uh, and investigator initiated trials? Sorry about that. Um, so, so preparing, uh, propo uh, preparing proposals and preparing for investigator initiated trials. This is some of our most high priority work. And this, this work is subsidized by the Cancer Center that uh, they want to help uh, the HCI investigators, cancer researchers at the University of Utah get this external funding and get these uh, clinical trials going. So this work is, is subsidized. Absolutely. So there's no charge to the investigator. Okay, excellent. Ken, did you wanna add something to that? No, I was going to make make it clear it was completely subsidized, not just partially subsidized. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, so uh, that that's great. Um, and I just realized that there was a, a question that was asked um, in the middle um, or a few a while back, uh, Angela Snow, and we didn't get a response in, but we we will. So that'll be a, a part of the um, this link that was just linked by Melanie. That's going to be where that these answers will be located just so everybody's aware. Okay, um, here's a question for the HCI data team for Deb, Ma. Um, where would a new HCI researcher start if they are interested in HCI data support? So I think um, as Andrew Post said, we would really direct most new investigators to have a conversation with research informatics first to figure out which system is really best to hold the type of data that you're interested in collecting. 
<clears throat> and um, we work closely with research informatics and they bring us into those discussions as needed. And then, you know, if it's determined your study will be an RSR, we'll be very, uh, very involved in getting that study set up. Uh, if it's going to be in CCR, uh, RISER will usually set up a new CCR cancer group. So we work very closely with them. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Andrew. Um, sure, yes. Uh, please do um, you know, reach out to me or Shirlene Hewitt and we can and we'll um, you know, learn about um, the sp your specific research aims and the data that you want to store and we'll um, and we'll talk about that with you. And then uh, you know for population science uh, related projects, then we'll um, we'll, we'll loop in uh, Deb and the uh, PopSci data team. Um, and then we um, research informatics and PopSci uh, collaborate very closely on supporting um, supporting researchers at HCI. Excellent. All right, thank you, Deb and Andrew. Um, here's a question for uh, Jeff. Yeah, and CQCI. Um, how do you add uh, PET CT imaging to clinical trials and obtain IRB approval? How long does that generally take? So that that process it depends on what um, radio pharmaceutical you're using. If it's an FDA approved radio pharmaceutical uh, for clinical use, things like FDG then that's a very straightforward process. Um, it probably takes a few weeks for us to compile radiation dosimetry estimates, and then you can submit an, uh, an amendment to your IRB protocol, and that's fairly straightforward. If you want to add a investigational radiopharmaceutical, then that requires quite a bit more work. If we already have what's called an investigational new drug uh, for that, an IND with the FDA, then it's probably a one to two month process at least. Um, we actually have to amend our IND to cover your individual clinical trial. Um, and then if there isn't an IND for it, then um, it's, it's one of those things that if you have to ask how much it costs, you probably can't afford it. So that could be um, years of development in, in getting something approved. <laughs> That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, um, another question for the Cancer Biostats team. Um, how do researchers obtain statistical support for manuscripts and other research projects? Hi, so uh, I think that we they can reach out to Ken and I and we can connect them to uh, an appropriate collaborator. Um, and then this, this sort of work, I think it, it's best if it falls under, um, you know, where, where uh, someone in cancer biostatistics is supported on the grant that the, the manuscript is coming from. Um, but there, there's, there's kind of limited uh, level of kind of first come, first serve um, support for manuscripts that don't have funding attached to them. The best way though, is if it's on the proposal, uh, you know, that, that we're supported on that. And then, then we're working on that. And that's also very high priority work. Excellent, okay. Um, okay, another question for uh, Deb and the HCI data team. Um, does your team provide training? Um, yeah, thanks, Max. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think I'll start by repeating what Deb said earlier about uh, the groups that we support, um, population sciences investigators, PSTO approved studies, and disease center studies. Uh, so we do supply, um, the data team provides training for um, research subject registry, RSR, which is our primary institutional research database. database. Um, our teleform for Teleform, which is our platform for processing machine-readable paper questionnaires, we offer training on how to scan, process, and QC Teleforms. Uh, we don't, however, train how to develop your own Teleform platform. Uh, then there's HCI's REDCap instance. Uh, REDCap has a well-developed web-based training platform that's available and we encourage people to watch these videos. There's a lot that study teams can learn to do on their own through that um, training platform. 
and then Progeny, which is the pedigree drawing software. Uh, though primarily utilized by our genetics core, uh, we do provide Progeny training for new users and work with them to get Progeny set up. Um, Brayden, do you have anything else you wanted to add to that? All right, there I am. Um, yeah, just kind of reiterating what you and Deb have said with uh, CCR. Um, we do help in the sense that we have cancer group specific abstractors that are more than well, uh, more than willing to help out with training on pulling specific fields and writing some simple queries that can help out a little bit more um, that are specific to a given cancer group. All right. Yeah, and I'll just finish with, so Riser would provide the general training for um, CCR and how to use the query tool associated with that. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, and then I, one, one other question while we're with the data team, uh, whoever's most comfortable fielding it, uh, which of the tools that you describe are the disease centers taking advantage of? Uh, I can answer that one. So most of the disease center data is in CCR. Um, and we, we do that abstraction under kind of a general clinical QA that's been acknowledged by the IRB. We are allowed to do that. Um, some clinicians, though, uh, do have studies that are in RSR or REDCap under a specific IRB. And then the disease centers also, well, specifically the GU team uses Teleform to collect their quality of life data. So kind of the tools that are currently being used by the disease centers. Okay, thank you, Deb. And then um, for Wendy, um, here's a question. What if I find a mutation in a gene that has clinical implications um, is found while doing genetic research? Um, you know, that, that is definitely a component of genetic research. Um, even if your interest is in looking for novel, you know, gene hunting, type experiments and things, um, you know, when you're analyzing DNA, you can find things that have known clinical actionable um, implications. And our team is here to help with that. Um, it certainly is best that, you know, for any investigators who are going to be doing genetic research, um, we encourage them to talk with us at the beginning um, so that we can include things, you know, in their protocol and in their IRB right from the beginning to kind of plan for that and how we would handle that for patients. Um, but even if this is a historic cohort or something that results are found in, you know, we have approved protocols for recontacting patients um, and offering them confirmation testing in a stepwise manner. Um, that have been quite successful. Um, also, you know, being that a lot of research now is being done under patients consented under the TCC protocol, that consent does include recontacting patients if there are actionable findings. Um, so that is something that's likely covered, um, you know, if you are analyzing avatar data or TCC data, um, we work very closely um, with David and his team to look at all that germline data and are returning that to patients. Um, so um, yes, we're here to help with that. If you find yourself in a situation where you've found something you weren't expecting and are wondering what's the ethical thing to do for those patients. Excellent, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I think um, these are the questions that I've received and you know, I feel like this has been a, a really great event. Um, I think we're going to cut out a little bit early, um, but I think this has been successful. We've had we had up to 120 people um, tuning in on this, and I don't think that we ever dropped below 85, 87. So I think this is a good indication that we'll probably do something like this again. Um, and I think the next time we do it, you know, it won't just be all brand new. If if any of the shared resources want to add to what was said here, I mean, I think that could be a great opportunity also. Um, so we can just kind of keep an open dialogue. And, and then, like I said, um, we will be posting all of these things. So the individual 
presentations will be available. Um, this in long form will be available. The questions being um, answered will be available. Um, so we really want this to be a, a resource in history that will go on and we can add to it and hopefully help the shared resources to, to triage just kind of those basic questions for people. And again, if you have ideas, anybody on this call has ideas that would be helpful, please send them my way and we'll, and we'll vet those and, and potentially get them on, on the next one. Um, okay, thanks everybody for your time. Really appreciate it.